would look at that Capitol dome behind me and say it had little to do with their work. There was a sense in the Silicon Valleys and Silicon Alleys of America that the whole Yahoo universe, the whole World Wide Web extravaganza, operated in a Wild West frontier, relatively free of government meddling. Well, it doesn't. Congress has the power to redesign the future of the online world, and some power players in this town are working right now to do just that, and not necessarily to your benefit. If you think the Internet can be a force for enlightenment and democracy, you need to pay attention. William Brangham produced our report. Our story about the fight over the online world begins here, the offices of a New York City startup. As you can see, the corridors are not yet bustling. But it's just possible this could become home to the next big thing on the Internet. We run the risk of being undercut by like a Google video. These four have started a website called blip.tv. They're hoping to ride the latest dot-com boom, the making and sharing of videos on the web. I thought I'd serenade you all with a little song that I wrote a few minutes ago. The videos on blip.tv tend to be homemade. You can watch this man's tour of public housing in New Orleans. Or there's this cooking show done by a young couple in their apartment. And over here, politics. Footage from a recent political rally in Boston. It's like a video flea market, and there's no doubt the reason a company like this even has a chance is that the Internet gives anyone connected a level playing field. You can watch a video from Blip just as easily as online video from a giant like MSNBC.com you know what? Use this. This is going to do better for you. Blip's founder, Mike Udak, says sites like his are doing an end run around big media. We live in the golden age of democracy, the golden age of, of small d democracy, if you like, because anybody can create a piece of video or a piece of audio or, or even text that reflects their thinking, and they can get that out to millions of people and, and potentially influence millions of people without having to go through any filters at all. But Hudak is worried that small-D democracy is about to get clobbered. Right now, Congress is being pressured to let the telephone and cable companies rewrite the basic rules of how the Internet works. The companies insist these changes are needed for the Internet to continue its meteoric growth. But critics say these changes could destroy the Internet's most important benefit to society, the easy flow of new ideas. That's pretty much it. Craig Aaron is with Free Press, a media watchdog group in Washington. They're part of a diverse chorus that is sounding the alarm about what they see as a frontal assault on the free and open Internet which we have today. One of the beauties of the Internet is that it's been open to views across the political spectrum. And if you, if you hand the control of the information so that some can be preferred over others, you're going to be handing back that control to the big media companies that already control our television, airwaves, radio, you name it. Give me a moment here to make the current architecture of all this perfectly clear. There is you on your computer, sexy devil. In most cases, the web flows into your computer through wires that are controlled by a handful of big telecom companies, the bells like AT&T and Verizon, or the cable giants like Comcast and Time Warner. The companies control these pipes, and they charge fees to anyone who wants to use them. But the deal is they can't mess around with what flows through the pipes. They're supposed to be impartial, hands-off middlemen. You want to email grandma? Well, knock yourself out. You want to build a website called TomDeLayGotARawDeal.com? Well, go for it. Everyone's websites are treated the same, whether it's owned by little old you or owned by tycoons like Bill Gates or Rupert Murdoch. This has been one of the ground rules of the Internet since day one. Some call it net neutrality. I think network neutrality is just a sort of a fancy engineer's word for Internet freedom. It's basically the idea that all data is treated equally, and the user makes the decisions as to which data they download, what websites they visit, what they watch and read online. Aaron says big telecom companies have declared open season on net neutrality. He says that for the first time, the cable and phone companies want to step in and dictate which websites will run better than others. How would they do that? The companies want to set up a guaranteed fast lane on the Internet. But that fast lane wouldn't be for everyone. Only the websites that pay a hefty fee get the speedier service.
What the cable and telephone companies are proposing is essentially erecting a toll booth right in the middle to uh, direct traffic, create an express lane for the products and services that they own, and uh, leave everybody else on a winding dirt road. Aaron doesn't begrudge the telecom industry for wanting to make money, and it is fair to say consumers would very much like to get TV shows and movies via the web that look sharp and are bigger than a business card on their screen. But their chosen business model for this upgrade requires the telephone and cable companies to drive a stake through the heart of network neutrality. And the industry has deployed a small army of lobbyists here in D.C. to do just that. They've spent millions of dollars covering Washington in recent weeks with ads, ridiculing this neutrality idea. Regulate something that hasn't been built to solve a problem that doesn't exist? Why would we do that? The big online companies want the next They argue the that some of neutrality's strongest supporters, web giants like Google and Yahoo and Microsoft, are going to continue making a fortune off the Internet, but are trying to skip out on paying to upgrade the network. They're going to make billions, but they don't want to pay anything. Instead, they want to stick consumers with the whole bill. And they call their plan net neutrality? The problem is that the Internet that we built to date is getting a little creaky. And without significant new investment, we're not going to be able to manage that traffic. So the question is, as we build this Internet of the future, who's, who's going to pay for it? Mike McCurry, yes, that Mike McCurry, Bill Clinton's former spokesman, is now explaining things for the telecom industry. His PR firm helped set up this group called Hands Off the Internet. They made those ads. They argue that net neutrality is standing in the way of progress. It's just, by the way, the same reason why we take 18-wheeler semi-trailers and make them pay more in federal highway taxes than someone who drives their family in a minivan because they are putting more load onto the infrastructure and therefore should pay a higher rate. But Democratic Congressman Ed Markey says this is about a lot more than just money. This is really a debate uh, over monopoly, over control, versus the ideas of even the smallest person being given access to every person in our country. Markey says the money issue is a red herring. You think the Googles of the world don't pay heavily to connect to that pipe? And what about what you pay every month to get that pipe into your house? So the Bells simplify this argument as though it's between them uh, and some other very large company. But it's not. It's really about uh, them, the Bells. Uh, and millions of companies and individuals around the country uh, who have used the web as a way to reinvent not only the economy but free speech as it's expressed in our country. Markey's greatest concern is that once the telephone and cable companies can pick and choose who gets through those pipes the quickest and who doesn't, they're in a position to potentially shape who the winners and losers are in everything from political debates to competing technologies. He says net neutrality can stop that from happening. Net neutrality is an essential part of the constitution of the Internet. Uh, it was built into, baked into, the very fabric of the Internet from day one. And now the Bells are trying to amend that constitution. And that's too dangerous. That's too high a price for the whole country to have to pay. And Markey is not alone. A group called Save the Internet has become the umbrella organization for a growing chorus defending net neutrality, and it is quite an umbrella. Left-wing bloggers and progressive voices such as MoveOn.org alongside, are you sitting down, Gun Owners of America, and just recently, the Christian Coalition. All these varied groups have expressed that fear. If you give mostly unchecked authority over the Internet to a few corporations, who knows whose data or whose ideas will be allowed through? I asked Walter McCormick, the head of the U.S. Telecom Association, about that fear. There are a chorus of critics who are very concerned that the people who own the pipes, who pass this Internet data through, would be able to discriminate against some websites, for instance, or be able to push others, promote others. We have said that in our industry, we will not block, impair, degrade content applications, services. So the experience that a consumer has today with the Internet, a consumer will have in the future. 
McCormick says the companies he represents are in the business of making money, and if consumers want to visit a given website, the telecom companies have every interest in letting that website through. He says the idea that they'd somehow restrict access to certain websites is overblown. It's, it's very difficult to deal with, with what-ifs and hypotheticals. There are enough problems in the country for Congress to deal with that are real problems, as opposed to worrying about what-if scenarios. But it is not all hypothetical. In 2005, a small phone company in North Carolina blocked their Internet customers from using a rival web-based phone service. The Federal Communications Commission said ixnay and fined them $15,000. That same year, the Canadian telephone giant Telus blocked their web customers from seeing a site that was supportive of union workers who had a beef with Telus. And just this year, America Online was accused of blocking emails from a group that were waging a campaign critical of AOL. McCormick argues these are isolated examples, and he points out that we already have a watchdog in Washington, the FCC. That's promised to make sure these kinds of problems are rooted out. The Federal Communications Commission has said that it has sufficient authority to disallow any company from blocking, impairing, degrading any kind of application or service. But advocates of net neutrality say websites don't have to be blocked or degraded to suffer from second-class treatment. Give the newest, fastest online service to a select few websites that have paid for the privilege, goes the argument, and what you build in is an unfair advantage for the richest, most powerful companies. If they're allowed to get rid of network neutrality, then they can favor Verizon Video or AT&T phone service or the new Comcast search engine over anything that I come up with, even if my product is better, even if I'm offering it for a lower price, by manipulating what happens over the network, they're allowed to favor their own content and those of their partners, and that means everybody else is left behind. It's really not about the Googles and the Yahoos of today. It's about the Googles and the Yahoos of the future. It's about the next Sergey Brin. It's about the next Jerry Yang. It's about the next Bill Gates. Remember Mike Hudak and his fledgling video sharing company called Blip.tv? He doesn't have the cash yet to hire big lobbyists, but he believes his big idea's only chance of flying is if he gets the same crack at the Internet as his competition, big or small. Without net neutrality, there's a good chance that a lot of small businesses will have very slow web pages. It won't be their fault. But the consumers, at the end of the day, won't know that. They'll just think that the business doesn't have, doesn't have their act together. The big telephone and cable companies have made very clear that they intend to do this. All of their CEOs have come out and said, we're going to build our model based on discrimination. They've said it again and again and again, and yet they want us to believe that they're not going to do it. Well, there's no reason to believe it. Internet activists haven't given up yet. They've been holding rallies to show Congress that net neutrality has popular support. But this year, industry has momentum in its favor, with lots of friends in Congress and a well-oiled campaign to push legislators in their direction and away from net neutrality. Jared, this is Justin. Uh, give me a call when you get a chance. We have some bandwidth issues. The end of last week, the blip.tv folks were having some growing pains. They just signed up some environmental groups to post their video on Blip's site, and the sudden surge of traffic overwhelmed their own computers, an embarrassment of riches in a way. But they got it fixed in time, and other riches came their way. Investors came through with some much-needed cash. Perhaps Blip.tv has a chance. They're being around for over a year and over growing a year. More. And revenue already. It's kind to of be profitable. To profitability. To profitability. Historians will look upon this era as at a time when power and discourse are moving from a few centralized locations controlled by a few companies to everyone. And it's a beautiful thing. And without net neutrality, we run a very serious risk of losing that.